Get Pucked. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Get Pucked podcast. Vito, Matt, and Dave here, and uh, thank you for joining us. we got a couple of things we're going to want to talk about today, but before we get to that real fast, just a reminder, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you like what you hear at the end, of course, a like is always appreciative. And as always, we like to throw out and just mention that anything you guys have to, to comment, anything you want to throw out there, we read all the comments. Good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. We're very, very eager to engage with anybody who's listening who's taking the time to engage with us. So with that out of the way, I want to dive into obviously the biggest news in the NHL. Uh, there was a trade. I mean, people are saying blockbuster. Eh, I don't know about blockbuster. It's a big name. It's, it's, a big big. Name. it's big. I mean, it's big. We're not going to discount it's big. I think the the behind the scenes of it, the 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 ramifications of it, the fallout of it are bigger than the trade itself. But we're of course talking about Vancouver trading uh, Rock uh, Besser to no, what? Bo Wait, Horvat. What did I say Bo Horvat. <laughs> Honestly, I always mix these guys up. Bo Horvat uh, to the Islanders for uh, Anthony Bolivier, uh, Ratti, the prospect, and a first round. 2023 pick that is top 12 protected correct top 12 protected so obviously from from the standpoint because this is a, a montreal canadians more focused podcast and so i'll just get your takes quickly gentlemen just on the trade itself and then i'd like to talk to you about how this might affect the Habs. so what do you think of the trade in general dave do you like it did they get enough vancouver that is did was there an overpay who won who lost I mean, it's going to be hard to say. I, I think the Islanders probably didn't come out ahead. I mean, maybe they got the guy they wanted, right? Um, I like Beauvillier. I thought he was good. I mean, maybe it's the good she knew type of uh, thing. I, he was one of the first people I ever players I ever interviewed, actually, in the Islanders locker room back in the day. But um, I don't know. I just think that the Canucks came out. I mean, look, that, that first-round pick is good. You, you get Beauvillier, and, and you need to move on. And I think that it's hopefully the start of some change in Vancouver – um you know a little bit because they they they're brutal they're just brutal as an organization and i guess we'll talk about it when you talk about the things around the trade afterwards but um i think they did okay i think again like the islanders man like okay i get their two points out of a playoff spot but like they're not world beaters i don't know like i don't know i don't know how, how i feel about it but i, I think uh, overall the, the canucks did well maybe they could have held out i think uh, one thing i could i could criticize them on is they could have held out to closer to the deadline if you're a seller there's no reason not to uh the value only goes up in your players and to just get rid of Bo Horvath, yeah, yeah a little, it's, curious. yeah it's a little weird yeah. but i guess maybe you know they know the temperature a little bit better around the league of what uh people were looking for for Bo Horvath, and maybe they weren't getting anywhere close to that elsewhere you know so yeah. I'm okay. I think I think they, they did all right, and I think that looking back in the future, I think you'll be like, okay, this was a decent trade. I mean, it, they didn't get robbed or anything. Bear, bear, bearing in mind, of course, that while Lou came out and said that he has like high hopes of signing him, there was no contract talk with also. him, which is very interesting. Um, and of course, we also just read recently, just to throw this out there before you go, Vito, um, that once the offer was in, Apparently, the Canucks did not shop the offer to any other of the interested parties. They they got what they got, they liked what they, they liked, and then they took it. And that was it, which is also somewhat interesting, I found. But mm -hmm. go ahead, Vito. Who's who's the winner and loser here? Uh, honestly, I don't, I'm not crazy about the trade, to be honest. I think for, who? Uh, for both, really. I get why the Islanders did it. They're kind of sending out the message trying to say, hey, we're not, uh, you know, we're still going to try to make the playoffs and whatnot, while the other team is trying to say, hey, uh, let's try to tank and do the best that we can to be as low as possible in the standings. Um, but I feel like they could have gotten more for Horvat if they just waited a little longer. That's a that's a big name that's off the trade block for, How much for the more? trade deadline. How much more could they have got? They got a first rounder. We don't think there's going to be a a, a non protected first rounder in this draft being traded. So, a top listen, ten. I'm not. Bovili is not a bad player by he's by no six. means. He's a bad player, but I mean, at the same time, he's always yeah. been the type of player that's left me wanting more. I've always expected him to be a little more consistent. I mean, the guy, I expected him in the past to be more of a fifty 
55 point producer and instead he's been stuck in the 30s um so there's consistency issues there now again he's still relatively young he can still turn his game around he's still only i believe 25 years old but um a first round pick is big especially in this draft it's top 12 protected and i mean by no means should they scoff at 13 14 or 15 if if the islanders should finish around there but again, I just feel like that was underwhelming. I know a lot of people are coming out saying, hey, uh, Kent Hughes is a genius. He got an unprotected first round pick. A 2023 for sure. Very, different. It's it's very yeah. different. Very different time. There was a lot more teams that were going after um, Ben Sherrod at that time. But I think if, if the Islanders managed to extend Bo Horvat at a decent contract, then I think that it's good for, for, for the New York Islanders. But if not, and they lose him at the end, then it was it's a it's a loss for them. What did you t- what is it, what was your take from uh, Alvin coming out saying that he feels like he got three first rounders for Horvat? Then he didn't pay attention because he didn't get three first rounders at the end of the day. And facts so, are I facts. Mean, I I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, like in the most technical of senses, I suppose he's allowed to say that. But you can't really look at Bolivier today and tell me this is like a. A top, well, top, top first rounder. I mean, he's a middle no, six, and he, their he's prospect not a, that they got also is drafted in the second there. round. Was he a second rounder? He was drafted in the second round. So really, well, then he's so then he's hundred percent wrong with what he said. Well, so well that's, that's interesting. So if, he, if he got, if he's saying he got three first rounders, he's he's incorrect. I'm pretty though. sure that's what he said. I'm pretty. He sure did that's say that. No, no, okay, okay, that. all right. Both yeah. both of them was drafted in the late first round. They did get another first round. And, and right Beauvillier, first round pick. Beauvillier, it's not a stretch to say, like, if he put, puts up 50, 60 points in the next few years, it's not crazy. It's not out of the imagination that he does yeah, that, right? So do he, it. he could definitely develop into something. So I like that piece for Vancouver. I like the first round pick. I mean, I don't think the Islanders are going to be in the top 12 anyways. I don't think that protective protection yeah, really it's, matters, it's but it's more on their end. I, yeah. I don't think... I don't think the Canucks were banking on that being a huge factor into the trade. But the fact that they didn't shop it around is weird to me. And that, and that means maybe that people have sour on Bohora, but I don't see how he's having a career year. Right? I don't uh, I don't think so at all. I just think that, it's it's a very maybe maybe they spoke to the player and said these are the teams that are circling around and talking. What where do you want to go? Like where do you want to play? Maybe it's already I been know, kind of discussed. If you're the Canucks, know. you cannot afford to do that. You cannot yeah. afford Who to do that. With these that's guys, the truth. man. Who knows? Oh, I know, I know, and that's that's why they're they're a dumpster fire yeah. organization. This is the second, uh, I think, podcast in a row that we mentioned the Canucks, and I have to apologize maybe for the to the fans listening, but they're just an awful, awfully uh, run organization right very, now. Very, and- very questionable decisions, and you know what? I think the biggest decision and the biggest mistake, in my opinion, is not necessarily what happened yesterday. It's the fact that signing JT Miller to a long term contract pretty much led to this trade. Because they should have signed Bo Horvat instead of JT Miller. You you definitely make a, a super valid point. I think a lot of Canucks fans, from what I've been reading, uh, feel the same way. I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. JT Miller had an enormous season. You know, there was there was a lot of uh, you know um, desire to get him signed. But it is it is an interesting interesting turn of events. But more importantly, what does it all mean for the Montreal Canadiens? You know, because that, well, that's where I want to bring it back. And I think, you know, a lot of people are talking, that's it, floodgates are open. A lot of people are saying, oh, there goes a big piece off the trade board right away. Um, so what do you think? Is this is this the start? Are we going to start seeing all the trades happening? Is this sort of like a one-off and now it's going to cool again until a trade deadline? Um, and does this, and for what Bo Horvat got in return, how does that how does that make you feel for guys who are obviously we've been hearing tons of names like uh, Josh Anderson constantly out there? Uh, not saying Josh Anderson's Bo Horvat caliber, but just in general, the return there. Do you think that that has anything to do, uh, or will play a factor in what the Canadians potentially might get for some of their guys? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I don't think the return really necessarily, but I do think it's a good thing for the Canadians overall because I think that it establishes the Islanders as still in the playoff race, so they won't be selling off. Uh, and same goes for a lot of these bubble teams. You know, there's a bunch of teams around that 55, 54, 51 point mark. Even the Flyers are still hanging around. I mean, if they don't, you know, firmly position themselves as sellers, well, 
that means the Canadians are the sell, are, are are have left less competition in terms of players they're going to get rid of. And I think that that makes it interesting. Whether that opens the floodgates right away, I don't think so. I think that you know the All Star breaks coming. Like you know what I mean? Like I think it's going to be a while before we see more intense action. I could be wrong, but. Um, I think it's a very good thing for the Canadians this, this move. I think it's 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 very decent and another again another that's just another piece to the puzzle that's off the board that now teams turn and have to focus elsewhere. It's gonna it's gonna get some teams, especially in the East, to start moving a little bit or start figuring out what they're gonna do or what the next move. I I have to think that when when rumors came out that Borhorvat could be available. For the trade deadline, there were a lot of teams, or at least a few, that were very interested in Bo Horvat. You know, there were rumors of Carolina, there were rumors of Boston, the Boston Bruins. All they're all teams in the East. Now the New York Islanders got him. Now let's. There, there's something I want to make clear too. They got they got Bo Horvat early enough that if the New York Islanders completely drop off, they can technically still move him again. I don't I mean, think they will, but they technically, if they know that yeah. he's not going to sign, I mean, they have a very <laughs> small window in which to do that. I don't know, man. Run. It's they low, man. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, crazy things have happened. happened. I don't think yeah. they're going to do it, but what you know, when you think of it, yeah, it, it helps Montreal because Montreal's got more pieces to move, and there's teams that are out there that feel like they're that they're always that one or two pieces away that they think that they could contend or. They could make a make a real drive in the playoffs and all that. And and Montreal has a few interesting pieces for certain teams. Uh, well, do they have a Bo Horvat to trade away? No, they don't. I mean, our big trade chip was Monaghan, but Monaghan's not playing. And every day that passes, his value goes down. I feel like it's been forever since we saw him on the ice, by the way. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how long it has been. Has it been There's- like a month and a half? They're supposed to give an update this week, apparently. Is it six weeks he hasn't been there? Seven weeks already? I just feel like we haven't seen him. We're at eight weeks. We're at eight weeks already? I think so. I mean, man, it has been rough. And I know a lot of people are stressed about this, thinking like his value is uh, is plummeting. There's no way you get a first for him now. He hasn't played since December 5th. December 5th. So that's seven weeks ago. We're coming up to almost two months he hasn't been on the ice. And you know what? And I just read that he wasn't at practice again today. But the, the, January 31st. Well, okay, to be fair, the all-star break is coming, so it's like, okay, who cares, really? You're not playing anyways. Get, yeah. You know, if it means you're well, going to get the extra couple days. But it would be nice to see him skating. That way you can kind of say, no, no, he's, he's on track to come back. But what I find, what I'm very curious about is that Montreal came out saying we're going to we're gonna update everybody on Monaghan's status at the end of the week. And that usually doesn't ring very well when you think of, okay, you're going to mm. update us. And you're going to say it probably in a press conference, then something might not be too good there. How sh- how shitty would it be if they're unable to move him? Like, how bad is it? Well, and I mean, it's it- out of their hands, right? Like, if he's injured, yeah. he's injured. There's nothing they could do. I mean, it's not a disaster in terms of, you know, they got a first round pick for him. So I mean, it's not as if. <laughs> that's what I'm going for. That was it, right? So, so you nailed it right there. Like, they've already won. You know, now yeah. it's all about like winning more. And which right. is nice, and everybody wants to always like win more. It's nice to win a hundred bucks, but it's always nicer to win a thousand bucks. I'm not, I'm not going to discount that. But frankly, a lot of people suggesting that Monahan not being back and now not being traded is like a complete derailment of the plan. And I'm like, guys, I don't, I don't think so. It would have been nice to flip him. I also think that if he doesn't get flipped now and they keep him here and he rehabs nicely, there's a very good chance you're going to see Monahan on this team next year. It's at very, discount, very possible. In my opinion, to be at a discount. And probably at a discount because he has to understand he's got to do a full season. He cannot constantly be hurt for half a season. No one's going to want to take that. So, yeah, I can definitely see that. And, I mean, for what we saw, he'd be a very welcome addition to the team next year. I mean, would I prefer to get a first for him now and then see what happens when he's, when he's a UFA? Sure. But today's point, you can't control that. So, with him out of the picture, they're big trade ships right now, as far as I can see. For Josh Anderson and Edmondson, these are the two main pieces. Um, that can go. And I can't see I, Eddie these days landing you a first. I, I think some. <laughs> I, was it the Athletic? I think this morning they wrote they had a podcast and they were saying that uh, Jake Evans could be an interesting piece for some some teams who are looking for a depth center or depth. Okay, that's not going to get your first. I that's mean, Jake Evans. Okay, I, I don't want to. Do I don't call back to next year to last year, but I mean, like if they Jake Evans gets a first round pick, I don't think I could talk about hockey. Anymore. 
Like, I, 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 I don't know if he fe fetches you that. I, I mean, I'm comfortable in saying Jake Evans won't get you a first round pick. No, no, but I'm not talking about a first. I, I don't okay. think the only player, in my opinion, that could probably get the Montreal Canadiens a first round pick is Anderson. Is today. Anderson. If people are saying Edmondson, it would have to be – it would be a very late first. But I, I think the Canadians for Edmondson would probably go uh, a first equivalent because I don't think teams are going to want to give up first-round picks this year. Not not easily, at least. I, I, I sure. got to agree. There, there was a point where I think that Edmondson would have netted you a first, but not now. Not with how the team has been playing, how they look, what's been going on. But Matt, Matt you're, you might not – maybe you're right, okay? But – Dave has said this countless times. GMs are just stupid. And there's I'm going, always a I'm going based on the eye test and the logic that I can put behind something. When I see the penalties he's taking, when I see his play that he's out there, not the character, right? That's an intangible that's always there. This is a good guy to have on your team. But I don't think that that necessarily playoff pushing teams care so much about that. They want to see uh, the value and the skill. And he has not been showing it that a team's going to give up a first for this. I disagree. He's got a playoff pedigree to him. He's also somebody that's very miscast right now and playing minutes that he shouldn't be playing. He's playing on a, he was playing on a top pairing in the Montreal Canadiens that's uh, called him a bottom seven team. He's not, he, the guy was never supposed to be playing a top, a top pairing minutes. He's a guy that you slot in on your second pairing who can provide some leadership presence, defensive responsibilities, and that's about it. What Montreal has the way Montreal has been using him is basically we, you know, as as the go to guy to to teach the kids to train do them. You and think other teams are going to look past the fact that he looks bad I think because teams, they yeah, think he's I do miscast. Think, I do think teams looked at that. It's just that it's it's what type of first round pick. If if, if that's the price to pay for uh, for Joel Edmondson as a first round pick, if the expectation is that it's going to be a top fifteen, top sixteen pick, it's not going to happen. If it's going to be a you know, oh, no. twenty five to thirty two. Yeah. It could work. Yeah, it's it a late. Work. It's a late first. I mean, no right? team that's going to go for. It has to be a contender. Team. Yeah, there's a link to Edmund, uh, Ed, Edmonton, for example, has there's been brought a couple times. Yeah, so that could be a fit. And Ed, uh, Edmonton um, went pretty deep last year, if I'm not mistaken. It's playoffs Ed, last Western year. Western Conference right? Final. Got, yeah, got swaps, but yeah. They so it would have been. It would have been if we put them this year in the same position. It'll be a late, late, late first. That makes perfect sense. But are they prepared to do it? Is the question. I don't think so. So, I don't so, think so last either. last year, I don't know if you remember, but like the buzz on Ben Sherratt was he was getting a first round pick. Almost, you know, everyone was agreeing on it. Okay, where is he going to go? Because people are going to be bidding on Ben Sherratt. You're not hearing that around the NHL right now. You're not hearing it from the insiders. You're not hearing it on Joel Edmondson, right? I, I, at least I'm not. I, I, everything I read, I see. It's just I don't think he looks particularly good. I'm with Matt. I don't think that teams could like teams are not. He's not the type of player that you look beyond his play, current play, right? You know, there's some players that you could, okay, he has such a good pedigree that you could look, you could look past the fact that he's on the Canadians. But I don't think that Joel Edmondson is that guy, and I think that it would be a huge mistake again. Like I, I, I say this every year, and then I'm wrong because someone makes an outlandish move and a, and a dumb move. But I just, I don't see it. I, maybe a first equivalent, perhaps you know, a, a, a prospect that doesn't fit into their system anymore that the Canadians can or stay out of there. Many. Exactly. Well, that's it. That's what I mean. You could you could steal something out of there that way, but a first round pick, even if it's a late first round pick, I mean, I think it would be a mistake for whoever's acquiring Joel Edmondson. And that's I, I do, I'm I'm in agreement. I really am. I as much as I would love to see him traded for a first, if that's what's ultimately going to be, and I'm not necessarily saying that I want him off the team. Like, don't misconstrue. But if they are looking to unload and they have a lot of defensive prospects coming up. And, and who knows what the offseason is going to bring, and they see an opportunity to get a first for him, yeah, you jump all over that without mm -hmm. question. But I can't see that this year. I also think that coming off the year that that Ben Sherratt, the previous season, you know, was that big Stanley Cup final, right? That was like, you know, him and him and Shea Weber, and everybody was taking a look at this, and they were, you know, his stock was at the all-time high. That is very much not the case for Joel Edmondson. You're, you're, you're so basing it entirely yeah, well, again, on what he did years ago. It's two different teams when you think of it. But at the same time, listen, I'm not suggesting that Joel Edmondson is going to get you a first no matter what. But there was talks this year that he would get you a first. I think there, there were talks. Yeah. I think, I think there's a And why it's kind of fizzled out a little bit is because 
now you're here he's hurt again and it's day to day and it's like okay there's no way if he's hurt again right before trade deadline he's gonna get you first how severe is the injury is it the back injury again you know they start off by saying it was a lower body then all of a sudden it's an upper body now the people are just cracking jokes and saying it's a body injury yeah i think i think there's also something to be said about how the ben Sherrod situation played out for florida right i think there's some general manager yeah. look at that and they're like hmm <laughs> what did Ben yeah. Sherrod bring to the Panthers and was it worth what they gave up for him? And then maybe, you know, the NHL is a copycat league. We say that all the time. I think that if I'm a general manager on another team and I saw what happened and I I'm very, very concerned about moving a first round pick for a Joel. Yeah, Edmondson. but I just think... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I, unless you're like a powerhouse and Joel Edmondson is the piece that's going to put you over the edge. And I'm just looking at the teams, I don't see it. I don't see anything. Yeah, I, think, I don't think Drew Edmondson's going to make that big of a difference. And I, I mean, I, there's a need, but. At last year's trade deadline, pretty much every team who sacrificed the first or sacrificed the first equivalent for any player failed. Because the only player that succeeded was Lekkonen because he got the yeah, Stanley Yeah, but, but you got to look at how they but, failed. Florida yeah. failed fantastically. Miserably. Like they were, they were like, they were probably one of, if not the favorite. And they were so beaten it was bad it was bad on them you know what i mean like there's a dip like you got to factor that in of course these teams are all going to try to make a push and get better that's just every season this is but what there's something do. to be said when you're adding too many pieces to a roster and yeah and such a short yeah. notice and they got to build yeah. chemistry and figure it out you could you can add everybody but if the players don't know how to mesh with each other just yet by the time the playoffs come around it's going to hurt you and i think that's what happened with florida I think so too. I think you're on the you're on the money there. But it's funny you mentioned chemistry, and it just jogged my memory about something too. A little bit on a tangent, not so much about the the trading or anything. But there's been a lot of talk about Kirby Doc and Suzuki, so like stupid. a lot of talk. I don't know. I don't know how plugged in you guys are about this, but I, I find it fascinating. And and Vito mentioned this before the um, the pod before we were streaming on the podcast here. And he was saying, like, why can't people just be happy having a good thing? And I'm 100% on, on board with that sentiment. Like, you have two young, great pieces. Be happy. Why do you got to compare them? And so it's the nature, I think, of a lot of fans just to, to always project and see how the team is going to look. Habs and stuff. And so, some Habs fans. In particular, there are some Habs fans. Fine. But it does bring to point, or rather to light, an interesting question. If Kirby Doc is a bona fide number two and he is playing phenomenally as a number two and you have suzuki as your one but you have potentially a pure luke dubois come or you you hit the jackpot and you get a connor bedard there are those three however combination that you put it in whoever's going to be third line center is too good to be a third line center They'd just be too good. Not to mention you still have Dvorak. You still have Evans. You got other guys that do this. So that begs the question, who goes to wing? And so now a lot of people are saying, while Kirby Ducks started the season on the wing of Suzuki and they had tremendous success with Caulfield, now you're hearing the narrative that it's Suzuki who should move over. I'm just curious, one, does it even matter? Is this just something to talk because people are bored watching a, a terrible season and they're like just coming up with things? Or... Is it something to sort of think about? Like, what would that do to Suzuki's game? Is it the more beneficial or less beneficial? I mean, we could talk about it all we want because we're a podcast talking about Montreal <laughs> Canadiens. And, but it's just absurd. It's absurd to even, if you lose a, like a minute of sleep or a minute of anything thinking about this, then you're on the wrong path. This is uh, predicated on a bunch of ifs. If we land, Con the, the Canadians land Connor Bedard. If uh, they end up getting a, a, a huge free agent center signed with the team, these are two huge ifs. It's a huge and if for Bedard, but it's a much smaller if for Pierre Luc Dubois, who, who outright it? said is he it? wants to play here. But but it's an if. It's oh, an if. if. How many, how many people if. say they want to play somewhere and never? How many players? Steven Stamp goes with the Leafs. How many players say they dream about going? It's happened. I think the only time I've ever seen it really is John Tavares going to the Leafs. That's it. Adam Nobody Fox. else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that's New York. New York is, I, I don't qualify New York in terms of free agency because everybody wants to play there. Right. So forget, forget yeah. about New York. Forget there about New York something City. about how Pierre-Luc Dubois mentioned it though. I, I mean, again, right. It'll be egg on my face, but I actually, okay. Okay. I think he's coming. Like, I think he means it. Okay. I think he wants to be here, but go ahead. Okay. But, but, but still we have a very small sample size with Kirby doc and 
it, it, to me, it's like we're not even close to playing that game yet in terms of, oh, man, okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to move Suzuki. We're going to trade. Like, we have to make room. They're too good for the third. You don't know that Kirby Doc's too good for a third-line center yet. Like, I, I'm sorry to say that that that's, you're, you're, it's in a garbage time lost season. Anybody plays better. Everyone's elevated. All their plays are <laughs> elevated. You can't tell me that he's ready to take on the second or first line center role because of how he's playing now in this garbage time. I oh, don't yep. believe it. I don't believe it. I, I like he hasn't even played center all year. Like, I, not, like it wasn't a full center at season at center. It, it's oh, recently he's been playing center. No, no, no. no but his play of late just lost play his play of late. Okay, now we caught up to you. So his play of late has led to this conversation to be had at least because he is playing very well. I think all three of us can agree he does look great. In fact, probably right now he's the best player on the team. Listen, I, listen, I like, like I like today, Kirby nice Doc. Today. Oh, sure. I, I like Kirby Doc. And sure. When we traded for him, I was very excited because of his potential and his upside. And now he's starting to find this game. He's coming around and all that. But to suggest that you basically toss aside Suzuki – because Kirby Doc is on a is on a good streak and he's showing some good possession and good flashes in his game is silly because at the same age Suzuki put up more number uh, put up more points than what he's on pace for. But I think That'll hold on work. a second, hold on a second, because I think it's worth it's just worth kind of bringing it back to to where this is coming from. I don't think anybody's suggesting that Kirby Doc's going to be the one C and Suzuki needs to move over. I think what people are saying is no, Kirby Doc is get... a better two C with whoever this other person coming Bedard. Uh, Dubois, whatever, that would take one seat. Now, what do you do with Suzuki? Because Suzuki would be too good for a for a two seat. So he, by okay. default, would have to go to wing. This First off, in that scenario, it's a fantastic problem to have. Montreal hasn't had an issue with centers for yes. for as long as I could remember. Okay, that's yeah. one. Two, no. Fair. typically, this might, this might shock some people, but when a team has a strength in a certain position... Typically, what they can and what they do is they trade a piece of that strength to address another another need. That's it. So if we have multiple Ooh. centers that are talented, who's, who's, being, wow. talented, guys, you, who's being traded? Who's being traded? I'm not going to say who's being <laughs> traded, but if I had to say, if there was a scenario in the scenario you suggested, Montreal got Pierre Luc Dubois. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, all of fine. a sudden, they got Nick Suzuki. Yeah. There's Kirby Doc there. Mm -hmm. They won the lottery and they drafted Connor Bedard. You're moving Doc. Well, yeah, okay, but hold on a second. That's even that's super far fetched because if they they're, win the lottery and they get Bedard, they're not going after Dubois. So pick one of the two. Make it a little bit more realistic. Let's yeah, say they yeah, don't get the lottery, they get Dubois. Dubois coming in. Now you got Dubois, you got Suzuki and Doc. Now you're suggesting a trade must occur, and you think it's I'm not saying not must most likely. The scenario that you were suggesting is that they're watery. They also got Pierre Luc Dubois. Like everybody's all of a sudden, nobody wanted to come to Montreal for the last thirty years, but everybody wants to come to Montreal, right? So if in well, that scenario, one's from then, here and okay. one's drafted. So yeah, right? but okay, I get your but point. At the end of the day, you can't just think, okay, we're going to have those play because you got to think of the the cap too. And at some point, two three years down the road. All these players are going to command nine, ten, and eleven million dollars. You can't pay them all, so who's you're going to have to look and say who's the core piece you're keeping? I don't think they're moving their captain. I don't think they would trade Suzuki, who's on a very good contract. At least it's looking that way. It's trending that way. Yeah, guys. And Dave, know. Dave's already exasperated by this comment <laughs> because because one thing, Matt, you said Nick Suzuki is too good for two C. You said that at one point, and, and that blows my mind. The guy has 38 points this year. He's ranked number 42 in the league in terms of points by a centerman. Like, how is he in any way, shape, way, shape, or form too good to be a two, two C? That's no, but crazy. I, I, I no, what, I'm so. I think the no. best way, the way Matt could have put that is if your team has Nick Suzuki as a two C. You're in a good situation. Well, that's it. That's and, but so that's it. So to me, it's not really even a problem. You move Kirby Doc to the wing. You put him at three C. I, I, I'm a big believer in center depth. I think that the biggest mistake the Toronto Maple Leafs did was dealing Nazem Kadri away to make room for. I, I mean, I know they had to, but imagine a lineup where Nazem Kadri is your three C in Toronto. They didn't it, have it, to. They kept Willie Nylander and, uh, and other pieces, that, and they could have moved one to keep. No, Willie Nylander is a stud. You well, don't to, know that. I don't want to, to talk to, about the Leafs. Oh, so. Yeah, okay. no, forget the least for a second, but I'm I do just, want to I'm clarify just, just on the point because you're making yes. here. I mean, do I think he's too good to be a 2C? I mean, I think anybody can do anything in the league. That That's that's aside from the point, but I do believe he is better than a regular, everyday, second-line centerman. 
He is a, you want to call him a 1B right now. I also have to look into who he's been playing with. And, and he was on a tear up until everybody started getting hurt. And then they started messing with the lines and putting him with not as efficient scorers and producers. Well, they're, they're, and that's a big factor when you look at these guys. I mean, even in the slump, I, still, there's still progression there. Even in the slump, there's progression there. I, I mean, he if still looking, looks he's on, good. He's, yeah. on pace, he's on pace to pass his career high goal, to, goal totals, and he's on pace to pass his point totals by a, by one or two. Which yeah. is, I mean, if not, he, okay, not, he's I mean, not he's slowing. He's, he's not he one point in yes. his last six games. No, he's for sure. Slow. But again, look at the team. Look at what the team's been doing. I think Fair, that's a but, massive, massive factor to the whole thing. Is he a top five centerman in the league? No, he's not right now. He is not an all-star elite I'm, top five C, but this guy is a first-line center caliber player. Tage Thompson yeah. has 68 points, and look who, 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 what team he's on. Sorry, like there, there, I, I'm good for making excuses for people. Uh, you know, Pedersen has 58 points in Vancouver, and they're a disaster. They're, they're a tire fire, and he has uh, all those points. Like, he has 38 points, man. That's that's 30 points less than Tage Thompson. That's 20 points less than Elias Pedersen. Like, it's okay to say he's not a bona fide number one center. Hey, I don't think that there's hey, a lot of Yeah, but the Tom. Okay, if we're yeah. gonna if we're gonna bring up Tage Thompson, I mean the guy's playing with a stud like okay, Dalene, ninety four points. Jeff Skinner is is benefiting from the way Tage Thompson is going. So I mean, they're Buffalo's firing on all cylinders. It's Elias Patterson. Okay, you, Elias Patterson's skill has always been there, but his confidence has been crap for the last few yeah, years. But who's he playing with? Let me go find this fast, fast because I'm curious. I have it. I have it in front of me already. All right, who who's on Patterson's line predominantly? Uh, Besser, Kuzmenko, but uh, there was Horvat at a point. Okay, look, look at who he has. You're gonna tell me that that I have to discount Suzuki when Pedersen has got 58 points and he's playing with those types of players? Who the hell is Suzuki had once the once Caulfield and Doc moved away? Who's he been playing with? Hey, once know they moved playing. away, but like the, the other player, Horvat's gone and Pedersen's gonna keep rolling. You know what I mean? Like I get it. Let's I understand see. that. Let's, okay, and let's still, see, he has Kuzmenko, see. and he's got, uh, and he's got Besser. Power, and on the power play, he's got Hughes, JT Miller, Besser. I mean, Besser. come on. And that's power play. They're actually getting power play points. Nobody on this team gets power play points. So, like, well, that's, again, that's another I, issue. I, I come back. Yeah, but that's power my play point, man. This is me. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, while I can concede that he is not an actual top five centerman in the league, you Stop. cannot tell me that this guy isn't a 1B. He's better than a two. Fine. He's better Fine. than a two. Okay. I, 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 he's better than a two, but on a very good team, he's a two. A and, very and, and, good team. Yes. I mean, yeah. Okay, fine. That's fair. But yeah. that's where you want to be. You want to be a very good team. You're building towards a very good team. And I'm just – I'm very yeah. hesitant to put Nick Suzuki – and and that's why I was he like I'm just very hesitant. I have not we have still not in my opinion seen a lot of him because we still have not seen them in a position other than that Stanley Cup run where you know it was ridiculous where they need to win and, and on a consistent on a consistent game? basis. Yeah. On a consistent long 82 game basis. And Listen. that's my concern for a lot of these players. And it's just – and that's why, to me, I mean, I, I still think that he can be, and I still think that he probably will be the number one seed in Montreal coming going forward. But it's just to, to have these conversations like, oh, man, like now if we sign – if the Canadians sign Dubois, they're going to be over so overloaded that maybe we could talk about moving guys around. It's just – it's way too early for that. And it's just – it's fun to it's talk fun. about. It's absurd. It's, yes. <laughs> it's absurd, but it is fun. But I do think that, yes, if Dubois comes in, Suzuki will go to two. He'll fill the two role, even though you can now say you got two first lines. If that's how you want to look at it, I, fine. But he would go to two. And then, and then you know, I just think that's, the role that's good. Change. I just think that the roles will change. If somebody like Dubois comes in and you have Suzuki as well, they're going to probably do something similar to what Boston was when when Krejci and Bergeron were in their primes. They're going to just going to be you know one line's gonna be a bit more two-way while the other one's gonna be more of an offensive it's force. a two-headed beast there's nothing wrong with it and i mean we saw it kirby doc was capable of going to the wing and producing is he prefer does he prefer himself playing center yes and i mean who's to say that maybe they don't unload dvorak and now kirby doc is the three c on the team which is actually more like a two c because we have two first i mean you know what i mean it's just names that you give to things but like we can, I think we can all agree. You bring it back to Vito's first point. This would be a very, very good problem to have. 
like a phenomenally good problem and, to have. And then you mitigate whatever contracts and salary and money whenever that does become a problem. And but like, the thing is, is Dubois, Dubois is a 2C right now, to be fair, with Winnipeg, right? Shifley is, is that, has that number one C locked in. Uh, up, up, and, until, uh, up until yesterday's mm -hmm. game. Up okay. until yesterday's game, Dubois was for the for one C. Then all of a sudden, I don't know, bonus went nuts and just yeah, right. But, but he's crazy. flipping with Shifley. But yeah. he flips around, and and that's another thing that like you know we talk about. Oh, I, I don't know if Dubois is a bona fide number one center either. You can have that debate as well. He's a very good player. He can also play on the wing if you want to move players around to the wing. Dubois can play on the wing. He played on the wing last year. Exactly. There's nothing stopping uh, Pierre Luc Dubois from moving on. I, I think he was a left wing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with moving him there if you need, if need be. I think that you know before you start saying like, "Ah, oh, we're too rich at center. Let's start dealing these guys." I think you have to take a long, hard look at what it is. I don't deal Suzuki because at the end of the day, well, I don't deal him the He made him the no captain. Suzuki. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, okay, Suzuki's upside is. Either in and around at a point of game center, and a, he'll have a strong two way game. Now, some people are shitting on the fact that the uh, he's, his defensive game uh, is not that great. Yeah, yeah, it is. He, they're just they're giving him a different role this year, and and the whole team is like is a tire fire. It's, it's it's terrible. The team's injured, and even if they weren't injured, we didn't have huge expectations of them. All of a sudden, you get some flashes of certain players, and it's like ah, oh, we expect them. We expect them to. To, to get Bedard, but also be in the playoffs. You can't have both. I don't think anybody's expecting them to get Bedard, but if they do get Bedard, that will change like a if lot. If they get anybody doing. in the top seven or projected top seven is going to make a huge impact on the Canadians. Whether it's I, this year, well, they will. Yeah. I mean, yeah. A huge impact on their future, not necessarily right away. But the one thing to... to, to to go back to what you're saying about Suzuki being a, like, I don't think he's a lock to be a point of game player. Like, I, I know that everybody likes to, to, to shoot that around. I see it on social media. You just said it. I mean, man, that, he still has a long way to go. I mean, he has, he has to basically right now. I said in and around. So if he's like a 75 to 82 point guy, that's how I see him. Okay. Well, he, in order to do that, he needs to put up 40 points in his next 30 games in order to really? be a 75 that's, point guy. I said his full, when he reaches his okay. full. Okay. okay, he's at, he's at I mean, that's fair, but year. he's on pace for a little over 61 this year. So okay, yeah. we'll see how it goes. Okay. He's just he's, he's 23. Yeah. He's 23. I know, I, I get it. There's 23 Dave, year olds who put up those points. So. Dave does not like Suzuki. We get it. <laughs> that's that's it's the complete it. false. It's it's that's <laughs> not true at all. My my true belief on Suzuki is that like he kind of he came here under the radar. He got drafted under the radar in Vegas, came here under the radar in the Pacioretty deal. Everyone was like, oh, Berger may want another player. They got Suzuki instead. What a fan. Then he kind of just blew up. And, wow, this guy was amazing. They liked his character. They liked it, the way he played the game. And they saw his potential. And I think that it kind of blew up too fast because now everybody's anointing him as the number one C and, oh, this point of game player, number one C, so much potential. I just, he has to get there for me first. That's the hardest part is, is getting there. And I until think that's, it does, that's fair. That's until fair. you can't truly, if you're Ken Hughes, you can't truly look at him and him put up 60 points for the next two, three years and be like, oh yeah, he's going to be an 80 point player when we need him. Like you, you can't, you have to look at what's happening and you have to see it, uh, how it's going. And that's the truth of it. But you, again, you another give point, the tools. You got to give I do. The tools and that's, and that's, that. And that's a bigger conversation that perhaps we could use our next is like they need to address this power play situation. And because now it's becoming like a culture, I hate using that word, but it's absurd, the power play. And it may be, he would easily reach the point of game player status if they had a working functional power play. And the fact that it's not even getting addressed, it's dangerous, man. You can't leave these guys three years, four years growing up learning this type of power play. Whoever, like, I don't know if you still want to blame Burroughs. Who knows what's actually going on in there? But you got to fix it. You got to yeah. fix it. They're and that's a thing. Man or close to it. It's, it's embarrassing, like, and and yeah. it's embarrassing that they've been this way for years with different personnel and different players and everything. Like it they haven't had a, they haven't had a good power play since Geek Garbino was a coach. It's, well, it's that's predictable it. and it's ugly, but it is a topic for our next podcast. <laughs> Let's nice. not let's not go too too far. I do want to wind it down real fast. One question. I know I didn't prep you guys at all, but just out of curiosity's sake, who do you expect to be the next big player dealt? 
Do you have anybody off the top of your heads or you don't Oof. you don't know? Just I don't know. I if mean, you don't know, then I want to rent the name. next one. Michael Meyer. Cool. And it's Jersey? gonna take a lot. It's gonna take a lot, but it's gonna be Timo Meyer. No, not necessarily. I just no, think not he's necessarily. Okay. Okay. I don't know if Jer Jersey has the pieces to make it happen, but apparently they they want a first, an A, and a B prospect. It's a big ask, but but that is a great they, name. Okay. I'm gonna say that there's a reason I've been stashing him on my fantasy team all year, and it's gonna be Patrick Kane. I wow. I think if you're Chicago, I, I, and that's if he wants to leave Chicago, but I think that he could be an awesome. Kind of under the radar because he's been a, not, not having the best of seasons. So he's going but... to the Rangers for Buffalo then. That's interesting. <laughs> Basically. Basically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but okay. at the end of the day, I think that he would make the most impact going forward. Because I mean, like you know, is Ryan o Ryan O'Reilly got hurt, right? And like, who knows what's what's he's going back. on? I, he's back, a, but I mean, like to resign him for a three on a three four year deal. Yeah. The that that's out there right now. Well, yeah, there's Tarasenko, right? That's on that market. Chikrin in, in Arizona could be a good one, but yeah, Matt. Oh, you think? You'd have to think St. Louis is going to start shift, uh, shifting some people. You, uh, you just at the last people. second threw out the name I was going to put. I, I think. Oh, it's I'm so sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. At the very last second. But I he, think, he's he's been name. he's been supposed to be like he was supposed to be dealt so long ago. Like, what's holding it up, man? Like, they're just waiting and waiting and see what they can get. Like, what if they don't ever hit the price they want? Well, I think they're going to bring it closer to the wire, but. I that's like will he be moved? I for sure he's being moved. I just you know we're picking random names here. That's my random name. I think he's he's the next guy. So so we got I like uh, it. yeah Ch Chikrin and we got Kane and then we got uh, Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. All right. We'll check right. in on this next time. We'll see if anybody else, if you guys are listening, who you think that might be. That being might be a fun thing to see in the comments. And we get to see and come back on who called it right and who called it wrong. Otherwise. Please, again, feel free to comment, like, subscribe, the whole nine yards. You guys know the deal. We appreciate each and every one of you. And on that final note, for Vito and Dave, I'm Matt, and this was Get Puck.